I would say my most important ideas come from just walking around the city, being in New York. I can meet inspiring people every day and I feel like it's just wasted time when I'm not here. In 2004, a high school student in New York City had an idea. Nicholas Heller had grown up in a household with acclaimed art directors in both of his parents, but his creative mind gravitated towards storytelling and film. In a matter of years, he would go from shooting DIY shorts in the neighborhood, to graduating film school, to moving to Los Angeles and directing over 100 music videos. But a quarter-life creative crisis would force Heller to move back home to New York and to find his true voice, the man-on-the-street personality we know as New York Nico. Since that epiphany, Heller has cultivated a shared universe of uniquely New York characters, amassed over a million Instagram followers, directed dozens of commercials and branded campaigns, and premiered his first short at the Tribeca Film Festival this summer. And it all started with one idea. How did your parents' professional life inform your ambitions? My parents, Louise Feely, Steve Heller, they're both artists. My dad was the art director of the New York Times for 35 years. He's written like over 200 books about graphic design, none of which I've read. I'm a bad son. And my mom is a more traditional designer. She's done the Tate's Cookies packaging and logo. She's done a lot of classic logos and, and branding. How did they sort of cultivate your creativity? It definitely helps having artistic parents, understanding parents. I got a lot of support from them. I would grow up kind of like going to dinner with all these famous artists like Art Spiegelman and Seymour Quast, Paula Cher. These are like some of my parents' best friends and I didn't really know or care who they were at the time and now I'm like, these are design legends. I've always had an eye for good design but it's never something that I wanted to pursue as a career. And you know, they never pressured me to, to go one way, one way or the other. I'd always been interested in film, you know, since I was in like eighth grade, I would say. And this was around the time that DTV was a thing. DTV uh, introduced a feature where you could see the guide on the TV. So I would like go through and see what movies were playing. And then um, I would always click info to see the cast. And I would get really in, into the idea of like memorizing the casts of these movies. So then that idea turned into me kind of like creating these fake movies in my, in my head where I would just cast them. And then that turned into me actually like writing scenes from these movies. I went to high school and then I took my first film course. The teacher was this gentleman named Chris Reed, who I definitely credit to like getting me started in the world of film and, and getting me interested in it. What parts of it were the most interesting to you? My teacher really had us like analyze scenes, you know, and Prior to that, I never realized that like every decision in a movie was made for a reason. And I was really into that idea. And then I just started making my own little short films at school with, with very messed up subject matters. Like my, my whole intention when making these films was to shock people and specifically shock my teachers because I knew that I could get away with making the most fucked up movies uh, just in the name of art. I would watch my teachers watching it and like they were so like, what the fuck is going on with this kid? Did you ever get confronted about the subject matter? Yeah, I mean, my parents would always be like, well, why don't you do something like a little bit more like wholesome, uh, a little less violent, I think was the word that they would say. Like my, my movies were very violent. I could tell that they were like a little concerned, but at the same time, they knew that this was how I was gonna progress. My advice for young videographers, filmmakers, is to just find something unique and, and run with it. Even if it's like a little odd or strange, stick with that as long as you're passionate about it. You ended up going to Emerson College yeah. in Boston. Mm -hmm. What drove that decision? I just wanted to get out of the city. Like my idea for college was like not being in the city, not being where I spent the first 18 years of my life. And also Emerson, you know, had a good film school. 
So I went out there and, you know, I, I quickly learned that like college is kind of like what you make of it. One of the big issues um, with, you know, going to film school and, and creating films was, it was a whole process, like going to the equipment center, renting out equipment, getting a crew, like all this stuff. And I just didn't have the patience for that. But when the DSLR came out, uh, I was able to get my hands on one and I just started kind of being a one man show. So I started making uh, these short films that I shot, directed, edited, did everything myself. You know, I recognized from the jump that I wasn't a skilled technical filmmaker. So I kind of worked that into the aesthetic of all my movies. You know, I kind of like created like a, a, a brand out of that. Like one film was from the perspective of the camera guy. You know, another film is like from the perspective of a security camera. So it was really about like the action in front of the camera as opposed to the technical skill and the look of it. I would upload these videos to Vimeo and like people around Emerson would watch them and be really into them. And I would try to make like one video a week. And then that led to me taking these concepts that I had and making rap videos with them. And I made this music video for this artist named Fresh Daily. And the concept was uh, he's meeting his biological grandparents for the first time. And he's a black dude and his biological grandparents were my gran like my actual grandparents. And the whole music video is just like him meeting these two old white people for the first time. Started working with Homeboy Sandman, who was like the first kind of like bigger artist made a music video with him about a man baby being born and it was all shot in reverse in one shot. You know, I was pulling from the shock value treatment that I did when I was in high school, but kind of like it belonged now, like it wasn't frowned upon. I did Max B's last video since prison. Okay. So he's in prison and then they hit me up to do a video for his album that just came out. And they were like, but Max isn't gonna be in it. So I was like, okay, so what do you wanna do? And this was a, around the time that the GoPro came out. Okay. So I had the idea to do like a POV video as if it was so it's Max. Max. Yeah. But it's it's a terrible video. It's really, really <laughs> bad, but I love being able to say that I did a Max B video. I guess you wrap up school. Did you finish and graduate college? Yeah, so I was making music videos um, my junior and senior year and Are you graduated. making any money doing this? Very little money, very little money. I was lucky if I would make like $250 for a video. And, and then I, what was the production budget on these things? Nothing, I mean, it was just me and a camera. But then I, I graduated and I moved back to, I was living in Brooklyn at the time and I continued making music videos. And, you know, now I started working with crews, you know, not, not big crews by any means. They were still like very low budget videos. So I was like, you know, I, I, I feel like I've exhausted all my resources in New York. Um, I've shot like every corner that you could possibly shoot in. I've shot with every like underground artist. Like I want to be the next Hype Williams. What's my next move? So I was like, I got to move to LA. With dreams of being the next Hype Williams or Spike Jones, Nico packed up and moved to Los Angeles. But almost as soon as he arrived, it became clear that music videos were a field in decline, financially and creatively, and that LA was just not as bad. So Heller made the demoralizing decision to pack it in and head back to New York City with no clear path forward. I think it was about like three months into being in LA that I realized I needed to, to call it. Like this isn't working out. I wasn't booking any work while I was out there. I was sharing a room. I failed my driving test three times. So I was biking everywhere. I was feeling so anxious, like my anxiety was so bad. I was just like, I'm not, I'm not gonna make it. Like I thought my career was gonna, I thought I was gonna be a music video director. You know, I thought I was gonna be like this 50 year old guy still making music videos for rappers and felt totally defeated. And I didn't know what else I could do. When you reflect on it now, what, what do you think was not clicking? I didn't have the right connections. I didn't have the, the money to like, create things on my own. Also, there, there came a point where like, I just stopped doing things for free. So I missed out on a lot of jobs that could have like, helped push my career forward just because like, I insisted on being paid for them. And what was motivating that? Uh, just being like, I'm not in college anymore. I need to start making money. But also like, I wanted to be respected. 
Are there any opportunities that you can like put your finger on to be like, yeah. it, it might have broken differently if I had been able to do that? I hit up ASAP Rocky right after he dropped Purple Swag. And he was interested in doing a video with me, but I brought up money and then he just never responded to me. Everyone was trying to do everything for super cheap and like the, the bigger the artists were, the more creative control they wanted and the less money they wanted to spend. And I'm starting to see that like, you know, being a music video director for a living is not really a thing. It went from sugar to shit yeah. as an industry in that like 10 years from 2000 to, you know, 2010, 2011. Exactly. Was it hard to call your folks and admit defeat? Yeah, I mean, it was the lowest point of my life. You know, in my eyes, my dad was like such a hustler. Like he was the art director at Screw Magazine when he was 17 years old. So, so I he felt, was the art director at Screw before he could legally buy Screw. Exactly. And then he was hired by the New York Times when he was like 21 or 22. And you know, my mom similarly was like, they're just both hustlers. So I felt like I had like very big shoes to fill. And I felt like I was way behind them. I've gotten a lot better at processing criticism. At first I hated it. I could hear like a hundred nice things said about me and then one thing that's critical, that's like what I dwell on, but you're always gonna have that no matter what. And it's only gonna get worse the bigger you get. So you just gotta learn to like take it with a grain of salt. And sometimes maybe you learn from it. You know, when I moved back to New York, I was super defeated, had no idea what I was gonna do because I would put all my eggs in this one basket and I was back home in Union Square living with my parents. I remember I went to, to Union Square just to like think, because that's kind of where I get my best ideas, is just like on the street. And I noticed this, this street character out of the corner of my eye who I'd seen like all throughout high school. Super tall, white dude with dreadlocks who carried around a 10 pound sign that said the six foot seven Jew will freestyle rap for you. I'd always kind of like considered him like a celebrity, you know, like a street celebrity, because everyone knew who he was. And I was generally pretty shy up until th that point, but I used this kind of low turning point in my life as an opportunity to just go and talk to him. And to my surprise, he was really receptive, and um, we ended up walking around the city together, and I asked him if I could make a documentary on him. And I'd never made a documentary before, but thought that this was like a cool subject. And he said yes. So I made this documentary, and I was really proud of it. And um, it made me realize that I could do short day in the life documentaries of New York City characters. And this was an interesting turning point in New York where a lot of these characters were either getting priced out or dying or, you know, um, just were fed up with, you know, being a struggling artist in New York, so they left. So I wanted to preserve this. Like I wanted to preserve you know, the legacy of Wendell, the homeless fashion designer of Union Square, who I'd literally been seeing since I was like 10 years old. And uh, I just ended up making a, a series out of it. But then like very shortly after I started making these, these short docs, I kind of used that as proof of concept to get branded content jobs. I think the first was something for TED Talks in collaboration with Lipton Tea. They flew me out to uh, Turkey to like make this documentary about these tea farmers. And then that led to, to more branded content. And then that led to commercials. You know, I created my own production company where I was making commercials. As you start to sort of fall down this path of, you know, commercial filmmaking and branded work, what were you feeling in terms of, you know, as a creative, were you feeling satisfied? I was starting to feel very satisfied. I was like, wow, I could be a, I can make a living be d directing documentaries. Like that's sick. I mean, I don't even think branded content was really a thing, like the way it is now. I never realized that someone, a brand could pay you to make a documentary. And also I was super happy making these commercials and I felt like I was able to like bring my, my style um, to these commercials. And because uh, the commercials and branded work was kind of few and far between, I had a lot of time to develop my Instagram. We would put these videos on YouTube and People really liked it, but it, they weren't getting as many eyeballs as I had hoped. And what kind of viewership were you like getting? 10,000 views a video, maybe even less. And it also declined. Like it, it okay. started high and then, you know, so I, I was pretty discouraged about that. And I was trying to think to myself, like, 
how can I reach a wider audience with, with this? And it was around the time that Instagram introduced video. So I started taking the characters that I um, profiled and I would just do little clips of them and put them on my Instagram. And I would shoot it all on my phone and people started to become attracted to that. You know, all of my favorite quote unquote characters are people who, you know, you would never find another version of them. I'm not attracted to like normal people per se. I like one of a kinds. So you start getting more and more commercial work, but you're concurrently developing this separate following, mm -hmm. finding these New York characters. Right. How formed was your idea around what that handle was gonna become? I had no idea what the handle was gonna become. I thought it was just a fun way of seeing New York through my eyes. You start to develop these relationships with these characters. Mm. How would you describe the relationship that you, that you have with these people? So, I mean, this was around the time that I started calling myself the unofficial talent scout. You know, I, I didn't have a big platform, I was but... Say, how, how many followers do you have? How, how many people are you reaching? A couple thousand, 10,000 maybe. So I didn't have a large following, but I would still post these, these people and they would get a great response and it would make them feel really good. And, you know, the more my following grew, the more I could help boost them. And that was a really good feeling. Like, I, I love being able to help people who I admire and I think are deserving of it. Do you recall when your handle went from being Nicholas Heller, filmmaker, to New York Nico? That must have been around 2014. My, my name is Nicholas, but it's not spelled with an H. It's N-I-C-O-L-A-S. And people always spell it with an H. And it's kind of annoying. Um, so I figured that by shortening my name to Nico with no H, <laughs> people will understand my full name is Did Nicholas people call no you age. Nico growing up? No. So this is... No, no. no. <laughs> it's a new that, it was purely because I wanted people to stop spelling my full name with an H. How do you know when to pivot? I don't know. I don't know when to pivot. Do you remember a specific video or set of videos where the brand of New York Nico really came into focus for you? I mean, there were a few times when you asked me about pivoting, I said I don't think I pivoted, but now that I think about it, I pivoted a lot. The account has matured a lot. You know, at first, it was basically like voyeuristic, simply voyeuristic, like I didn't build relationships with people. But as time went on, I started building relationships and doing like these mini interviews so that you could learn more and more about these characters. And, you know, I, I think there was, there were a few videos that went super viral. The, the first memorable one was, it was around the time that the fidget spinner came out. That was a moment. Yeah, and I gave a fidget spinner to Matthew Silver, the performance artist, and he just like did his thing with the fidget spinner and, and it just went crazy. Like everyone was resharing it, it got, millions and millions of views and that like boosted my followers from like maybe 50,000 to like 150,000 or something. Okay. So I started getting like a lot more eyeballs on my page through that. But I would I would say that the pandemic, you know, to fast forward, that's when I really had to pivot and figure out you know how I can continue doing what I do without physically being outside interviewing people. So it brought me back to when I was in LA and I was like what what am I going to do? with my life. As was the case for so many businesses at the onset of the pandemic, the future of Nico's bubbling Instagram celebrity felt very uncertain. What would this tectonic shift mean for a guy whose brand was built on being outside? But necessity is the mother of ingenuity, and Hellard managed to turn the limitations of the lockdown into an opportunity to build an even deeper connection with his now captive audience. Creating viral challenges like the Best New York Accent Contest, Nico tapped into the global reach of New York's local pride and exploded the size of his platform and broadened his cast of characters. You know, when, when the pandemic first started, it was like, are we ever going to go back to normal? Also, I got COVID right away, so I was like sick, you know, thinking I might die. 
and if I didn't die, like, would I still be able to do what I do? So it was, it was a very bad place that I was in. But I kind of took that and I turned it into a positive. I started this competition called the Best New York Accent Contest, where I had people submit videos of themselves talking about why they have the best New York accent. It was basically what I was doing before, but just having people kind of self-tape themselves. When you were ideating these things, do you do it all by yourself, or do you have a brain trust that you well, sort would, of bounce ideas off of? And No, this, this, I just thought of it, and I don't really, like, let ideas marinate. If I think it's a good idea from the jump, I'll just run with it. So I remember I had the idea to do this, and I immediately hit up Wayne Diamond, who is one of my my friends and you know he's a he's a fan favorite on my page and I said hey I want to do this contest can you kick it off and just like send me a video of you you explaining why you have the best New York accent and I posted that and then the submissions just started trickling in and at first it was very slow but then Alec Baldwin posted one and that's when people were like oh this is worth submitting to you know who ultimately won so Charlie the Wolf ultimately won who is a also a fan favorite from my page. People think it was it was rigged because, you know, he, he's he's a part of my my camp. But um, how did you determine? We did a vote. We had the fans vote, so people would vote in the stories for like who they wanted to see move on to the next round. After the best accent, I did best New York T-shirt and best New York photo, where we raised a ton of money for charity. I mean, that's kind of when I realized that I could also use the platform you know, to, to help people financially, help businesses, help organizations. Because in my eyes, like, once we lose these businesses, like, New York is gonna be like any other city. Because these businesses, they breed character, and, you know, it's not just a business, it's, it's the character and the, and the people that go to these businesses. And preservation is, is super important to me. You went to Henry Yao, who has the Army-Navy store. Yeah. So that was actually the first business that I, that I helped. A friend of mine just told me that he needed, he needed some support because he hasn't been getting any foot traffic. So I went to go visit him. I'd met him a couple times in the past, but I made a post about him and immediately the, the comments started flooding in being like, oh my God, I love Henry. That's so sad that he's struggling. And you know, we raised like 50 grand for him in a couple of hours. And then that's when I realized, oh shit, like there's a lot of other businesses in New York that need this kind of help. Over the course of the pandemic, I like to think I helped just under 100 of them. A President's Lifetime Achievement yeah, Award? Yeah, President's Lifetime Achievement Award. It's early in your career. Yeah, I know. What do I do now? <laughs> yeah, that was for uh, some of the work that I did during the pandemic. I know at one point you started making merch and doing commerce as well. How did that start? It started because it was during the pandemic and I wasn't making any money. I was like, oh, I mean, if I'm not booking jobs, I might as well just try to sell some merch. And I was selling merch and then the jobs started coming back and now I don't feel the need to make merch anymore. If you see more merch from me, know that I'm not doing well financially. <laughs> I don't want to like do too much, you know, like people have asked me to do podcasts and like, you know, web shows and stuff like that. And it sounds cool, but like, I'm kind of just like, I just want to focus on like one or two things. At what point did your work as a commercial director really become completely blended with your life as New York Nico? Like November of 2020, I was asked to help my friends uh, produce this commercial for the Knicks. You know, they wanted me to just like come on and, and help them produce it, but mainly cast it. So I, I casted it with like all my my people. And that's when I realized like I have a roster of amazing New Yorkers who, you know, are perfect for stuff like this. Then I kind of went on to start directing projects like that. Do you have a financial relationship with your characters? Yeah. As soon as brands got involved and like wanted to, you know, incorporate my talent into commercials or whatever, branded content, then that's kind of when that financial relationship came up, you know? And, and I, that's, I love that. Like, I love being able to hire 
like Cougine, for example, for a Popeyes commercial, you know? Like I'd much rather, as a, as a consumer, see Cougine than just some like random person who got the job on Backpage or something. I mean, obviously money is important, but it's not the most important thing in the world. I'd much rather inspire people and make people happy than be a millionaire. How do you think about the balance of, you know, obviously you yourself have become a celebrity, a local celebrity, but balancing how much of yourself to include on the handle and how much to keep it focused on the characters? I kind of hate being the center of attention. I generally don't do interviews like this because, well, A, I'm generally uncomfortable in front of the camera, um, and B, I kind of want the focus to be more on my vision of New York and not me. Like my page is my lens on New York and its people. It's not about me. And that's just always how I wanted to do it. How do the, these inbound opportunities come to you? Through Instagram mainly. I mean, I'm so signed- people just DM you? Yeah, I'm, I'm signed to a, a commercial production company, Missing Pieces. I'm signed to a talent agency, UTA but most of the work I get just comes directly to me. I'm, I'm pretty accessible, you know, like if, if you want to reach me, you can probably reach me. What is the biggest challenge to running the handle now for you? I don't know. I mean, I feel like I'm still like doing it for, f I mean, I'm still having fun with it, you know, like I, I don't consider it going to work and I don't think I would be doing it if I considered it going to work. Like all the, the jobs I get out of it are things that I want to do. For that reason, I mean, I, I, I don't think there are many challenges. You know, you said at the beginning of this that you were not very comfortable talking to strangers and talking to people. How has the growth of the handle and, and this whole brand changed you as a person? I feel a lot more confident. I'm not as anxious as I used to be. You know, my anxiety was really bad, like debilitating. That's a whole nother story, but like, yeah, so, yeah, totally. just like experiencing physical symptoms of anxiety, like constant panic attacks, being lightheaded all the time. But now I just like, the more confident I am, the less anxious I am. How did the idea for your first short film come? I don't like the title influencer. A lot of people use that to describe me and- I, I can imagine. Yeah. I mean, I get it, like I'm, I have a lot of followers on social media, so people will consider me an influencer, but I've always considered myself a filmmaker, a documentarian, and I've always wanted to make a movie, you know? And I, and I have, like I've made short documentaries, but I've wanted to make like a, a real narrative film that like went to festivals. And I spoke to my, my friend Kareem Rama, who's a comedian and a writer, and I had this idea for a, a short that I really wanted to make. So I, I was like, hey, can I give you this premise? You put something together and then we kind of like go back and forth. And he said, yes. So I gave him the premise, which was, you know, a guy needs to find a bathroom in New York City before an important date. And I wanted to incorporate all the characters from my Instagram. We shot it and now it's premiering at Tribeca. And I'm really excited for the opportunities that might come from that. Is your ambition to develop this into a full length film at some point? My, my ambition is just to make feature films about New York with my characters. Where does New York Nico go from here? I don't really like set goals for myself because everything that's come in my life has come because of something that didn't really go as planned. So, you know, I want to make a movie, a feature length movie. I want to make a TV show. I want to do more in that world, but I'm also just content kind of going in the direction that I'm going right now and just see where it leads me.